Good evening and welcome, and welcome to everybody online. It's nice to see you. Um, my name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education here at the Barnes. And I am delighted to um, welcome you to this first lecture tonight in the, our three-part lecture series marking the 150th anniversary of the first Impressionist exhibition in Paris. Um, I'll just say right off the bat that the next two lectures in this series are coming up on November 14th, and that will be Michelle Foa. And um, on December 12th, I will be speaking about Renoir. That, um, that exhibition, the, the first Impressionist exhibition, was a, a major historical event, um, an event that really sh um, you know, um, shifted um, the, the whole the history of, of modern art. And it's being celebrated by institutions around the world, um, most notably in the form of an exhibition organized by the Musée d'Orsay and the National Gallery of Art, um, and it's currently on view there in Washington, D.C. While the Barnes is no, uh, known mostly, we're, we're known mostly for our collections of post-impressionist works um, and early 20th century modernist works um, by artists like Cezanne, Matisse, Picasso, we do have some very important and beautiful impressionist paintings, and we wanted to shine a spotlight on them this fall. So tonight, you will hear Andre Dombrowski talking about Monet's Studio Boat, uh, one of the most beloved works in our collection. Andre will consider this painting together with the artist's many other works depicting water, asking questions like, how do you go about painting a surface that is constantly changing? And what does Impressionism in general uh, say about how we experience time? Andre Dombrowski is, get, get ready for this, Francis Shapiro Weizenhofer Associate Professor of 19th Century European Art at the University of Pennsylvania. His 2013 book, Cezanne, Murder, and Modern Life, won the Phillips Book Prize. And his newest book, Monet's Minutes, published by Yale University Press last year, explores the relationship between the Impressionist instant and period technologies of timekeeping. Um, I also want to just tell you that Andre is a dear friend to the Barnes. Um, he has consulted on many projects. He was a contributor and co-editor for, uh, for our Cezanne catalog. He's a frequent instructor in our adult education program, and he's a member of our college and university advisory committee. So please enjoy and welcome Andre Dombrowski. Thank you, Martha, for that, uh, that lovely, lovely introduction. Thank you. And, and welcome, everyone, on, uh, uh, on this absolutely gorgeous uh, fall uh, Philly day and evening. The, the folks in Florida are not quite so lucky with their weather, so I think we, we might want to be especially grateful for uh, what we have. Um, on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, at, from 5 to 7, I usually teach a lecture called Impressionism uh, this fall, and uh, quite a few of my students are here uh, this evening and online. I'm, I'm not sure whether they consider this an, an added bonus or an added punishment, too. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I better not probe into the matter. Um, uh, a couple of thank yous. So, so first, thank you again to Martha, Lucy, and to Aaliyah Palumbo, and to the Barnes in general for the invitation and for organizing this, uh, this wonderful lecture series. I look forward to the next two installments uh, myself. Um, part of what you're going to hear today uh, is uh, prompted by an, an invitation for uh, uh, for an exhibition that's actually upcoming next year at the Brooklyn Museum uh, on Monet and Venice. Uh, and I want to thank Lisa Small for the invitation to think about Monet in Venice. So um, uh, otherwise I may not have done so, and it actually has prompted some, um, some, uh, some I hope, uh, interesting ideas. Finally, I uh, want to thank uh, someone with with whom I've thought about Moni for the last uh, decade or so, and that's Miriam Stanton, uh, a PhD 
uh, a recipient uh, at the, in the department who finished a dissertation a few years ago on images of suspension, including Monet's, and it's a really brilliant work, and I have loved uh, thinking about the matter uh, with her. That is it. Um, Monet is the paradigmatic painter of water, but also the paradigmatic painter on water. A water surface is Monet's ideal surface, refracting back the sky above or the scene at the center at the other shore. These refractions are, of course, already virtual and imagistic, natural pictures that were Monet's central topic, often taking over more than half of the painting's surface. These refractions are destabilizing and in line with what the 20th century critic Michel Butor once called Monet's upside down world, profoundly off balance. These feelings of spatial instability in front of a Monet painting are heightened by the fact that Monet so often painted them from the unstable surface of the water itself, painting in rowboats, studio boats, or gondolas. The results are pictures which are set up to look mobile and fleeting and evanescent, paintings in which not just reflections float by and shift shapes, but the painter was being toggled back and forth himself, a feeling transferred to his viewers in the act of looking. That this whole set of issues was central to Monet, to Monet's practice, is not just confirmed by how often he painted watery surfaces, but also by how often he painted himself in the act of painting watery surfaces. The Barnes, of course, has a beautiful example of this kind of meta picture. Monet is the studio boat of 1876, where we see a figure sitting in a studio boat floating down a small side river to the Seine. Impressionism rarely produced meta pictures or paintings about the act of painting, in part because there is usually too much setup, mirrors, and image reversals involved in such imagery, which of course goes against the impressionist ethos of ease, immediacy, and provisionality. So, Monet must have made the painting to see himself or see others painting on water, because it offered an interesting subject matter in itself. This might explain why viewpoints, distances, and characters changed so frequently in these pictures. Here is the group of them that Monet made in and around 1876, so around the Barnes painting. For one, I have never been fully convinced that the figure we see in the Barnes painting is actually Monet himself, as has often been said. This would require so many steps of the imagination on Monet's part, remembering what it was like on the boat when back on shore, then painting that memory. This seems to me too complicated, an impressionist setup. Instead, are we perhaps seeing the helper that Monet brought along for such trips, who was tasked with ordering his canvases and helped him with the materials? I think it's definitely possible. The other scenes Monet made that year of a similar scene, none I might add quite as beautiful or well executed as the Barnes version and much less well known. I, uh, I think you will agree when they were up there that, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, but nonetheless, they are interesting. So um, uh, well picked among the group, I would say, you know, Barnes Foundation. Um, at times show two figures on the same studio boat floating in the distance. Uh, I think you have seen the second figure by now that pops up on occasion too. This does not um, make explaining the scenario any easier since now we must assume that Monet did not just remember himself but also his helper on the boat when he painted that memory later. Perhaps these are two different figures altogether. Of course, given the distance at which Monet keeps this visual information, he never really wanted us to know who's in these boats in any case. Here he is different from Manet, who clearly painted Monet and Camille Dancieux, the latter's wife, in the boat painting, but of course, never himself, never Manet, that is. Here are the Manets. 
Monet's studio boat paintings then raise questions around the authenticity of Impressionism, around what it means to create an authentic, incontrovertibly present scene in front of the painter and to render it in that very moment of direct confrontation between subject and scenery, which is the great dream Impressionism always pursued but rarely fully reached. What we see here, and this is why the Barnes painting, at least to me, is significant, are the early signs of the breakdown of this logic as it was taking shape. By this I mean that by 1876 and 77, the years of the second and third Impressionist exhibition, so I apologize that this talk is not about 1874 and the first <laughs> exhibition, but at least the second and third were mentioned, okay, just to, in case anybody was counting. Uh, impressionism already started to make room for fiction, fantasy, and memory then in representation, such anti-impressionist themes. And Mooney did that when he allowed the possibility that this was him, right? I'm, I'm not sure he's denied, he, he wanted actively uh, for us not to think this is him. He, he left that open, I think. For imagining and remembering as opposed to seeing oneself at a certain location became more crucial aspects of the style as the 1880s approached and post-impressionism and symbolism began to invade impressionism and destabilize its account of plein air practice, directness and accuracy of observation. Another way to read the practice of painting studio boat paintings, however, is a desire to render the practice regular a particular and granular, to explain it, to give it concrete parameters different from its unstable, upside-down outcomes. One way to justify their existence is to see them as visual explanations and justifications of an emerging form of picture-making, a form of visual persuasion. To make palatable and, rep palatable and representation, Monet's upside-down world is to accept space in representation as compromised, as permanently topsy-turvy, as irredeemably unmoored, but still to designate time in opposition as stable and coherent, perhaps. Moni achieved this by focusing so much, by focusing it all, it sometimes seems, on the instant and the moment as the only viable time frames of modern painting. If there's one uniting quality of Moni's Impressionism, it is that all pictures appear so strangely swift and short, no matter how long their literal execution. For it remains curious and largely unexplained, um, and this will be my main question for the rest of this talk, why it is that when, when Monet went out on studio boats and other vessels, he did so at extremely regulated times and time intervals. In his studio boat, he had grooves laid on the bottom for the highly regular storage of the paintings he was working on, so he could keep them in a temporal order. He rode out in extreme temporal regularity as well. The journalist Maurice Guillemot, for instance, who accompanied Monet on a studio boat painting trip in 1896, recalled famously that every day started like clock time at, I quote, the crack of dawn in August, half past three. Trois heures et demie is the uh, French. You see it up there. Um, oh, I, oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know, 3.30, start to the day, not my time. Um, Moni started painting at a specific clock time then, that's the point, not at an actual sunrise that he was then trying to capture as in his series of mornings on the Seine. It becomes clear that the unstable encounter between painter and water perhaps required this temporal precision and such specific schedules, as if Moni thought that a stable time could compensate for an unrestrained space. A few years later, when painting in Venice, the city of water, this conundrum came full circle. It is well known that, though less well understood why, Monet generated one of the most stringent and unforgiving painting schedules he ever deployed while in Venice between early October and early December 1908, dividing his day into two-hour intervals of painting the same motif, then moving on. He and his wife Alice got up at 6 a.m. and he was at work starting at 8 every day. This schedule overrode all other markers of time. 
It was followed more or less each day of serious work during his two month stay. And like any modern schedule, including those of train systems and workspaces, it knew nothing but the clock clocking of time itself. But why would a painter tourist like Mone, to ask this again, have a need for such orderliness and such a pedantic way to structure his day? So much more reminiscent of the modern metropolitan office than the lagoon environs of Venice, so layered as they already were with historical time. The rest of this talk will analyze the crucial temple conundrum of the Venice scenes, namely why a group of paintings trafficking in the temp atemporal images of Venice were nonetheless created in accordance with one of the most exacting schedules Moni had ever implemented. How and why do the two go hand in hand in Venice, and it seems in Venice alone, or at least primarily? Why was there a special need for such a schedule for Moni when he painted on Venetian water? When Monet painted Venice, so critics felt in the late spring of 1912, as the canvases were on display at Bernheim Jeune Gallery, he made the city disappear. Venice vanished in front of our eyes, so volatilize, to evaporate or to turn vaporous, was one of their favorite and oft repeated expressions. A city almost entirely unmoored from the usual parameters of the real and any concrete conditions of weather, light, and space. Venice's churches and palaces dissipated within a colorful haze, hovering above their watery reflections as if they were mere projections and evanescent dreams, not actual buildings made of brick and stone. In the 29 works on display in 1912, time seemed suspended as well, and the famed Impressionist instant was difficult to register and localize with precision. Gustave Geoffroy, in an essay for La Dépêche of May 30 of that year, said it best when he concluded that Venice, Venice was, I quote, suspended in mist, which makes one wonder about the disappearance of time. The times that he has affixed were ephemeral, but they have the enchanted beauty of a vanishing life." End quote. Geoffroy meant these sentences as high praise. Having written about Monet since the mid-1880s for more than 25 years by 1912, he understood well the overall trajectory of Monet's art and the new chapter, The Venice Pictures, inaugurated. A profound tension implicit within the Impressionist picture from its inception, but never before so dramatized, had come full circle. The moment that Monet had concretized in representation, fixé is the usual French word here, had not only been rendered as transitory, a veritable image of the speed of atmospheric change, but also as seemingly untouched by a vanquished temporality. The final part of Geoffroy's statement includes a double meaning. This, his enchanted beauty of a vanishing life refers both to Venice's famed historical aura of decay, as well as the arrest, the death even, of life and time themselves. In 1909, Henry James spoke similarly of Venice as a mausoleum, he said, with a turnstile at the door, end quote. Continuing that, Quote, nowhere else has the past been laid to rest with such tenderness, such a sadness of resignation and remembrance, End quote. To Geoffroy and to James in Venice, these temporal connotations applied in equal measure and started to mean the same thing, namely that time was present but standing still there and even seemed to run backward. All these commentators on Venice then thereby inadvertently underscored what an unusual impressionist topic Venice truly was, one where a sense of eternity could be seen and experienced precisely from or through the vantage point of the instant. Other critics concurred with Geoffroy. One writer going by Parisiana spoke of Monet's, I quote, song of time, end quote, in Venice, chanson des heures. Uh, as if hours sang rather than ticked, you know, mine, mine tend to tick, they don't tend to sing. Um, and Arsène Alexandre coined the fortunate phrasing that, 
quote, these are hours of silence that Monet has chosen, end quote, meaning he observed pictorial time frames that were in fact taciturn about the passage of time. Yes, there were morning or afternoon effects and a dramatic sunset painting closed the exhibition, but these atmospheric conditions no longer seemed fully natural in the setting of Venice, but willed into being by the painter and the long tradition of painting the city that had preceded him. They appeared as mere citations of temporality rather than the time that anchored and suffused his usual representations. The art historian Joachim Pizarro extensively analyzed Monet's rigorous Venetian schedule for an exhibition called Monet and the Mediterranean in 1997. And he has to be credited with making it a meaningful aspect of Monet's artistic practice, rather than a peripheral and unimportant detail of his daily work habits, as you may think too it is. Hopefully I'll convince you otherwise. Pizarro concluded that abiding by a strict routine helped Monet eliminate time from representation altogether. Quote him here, in Venice, Monet was not interested in the slightest in recording the passage of time, Pizarro emphasized and continued. On the contrary, for him, time seems to have stopped in Venice. The flux of time virtually congealed on the surfaces of his canvases, end quote. We should add that this phenomenon became all the more acute for Monet in Venice, where water held such a special place in his representations. Often half the paintings are watery surfaces, but also half of his experience of the city was spent on water. In Venice, Monet painted seemingly timeless views paradoxically generated by this modern schedule and as the product of that schedule. Time was not there in the paintings as the typical fleeting impressionist instant, but as a modern context that newly organized and subsumed all temporal experiences, including Venetian time, rendering them indistinguishable precisely in their uniformity. Moni thereby made a set of paintings acknowledging that the timeless image of Venice was a unique creation of modernity and more precisely the concrete times of modernity. That concrete timing, however, seems to have been employed to make the unstable nature of water more real and present and concrete. By all accounts, let me tell you a little bit more about that schedule actually, Monet's schedule was a generative feature of painting the city. He divided the famous terrain up into roughly 10 different motifs and painted the major ones about six times during a set of two hour windows every day, others two or three times. Over the course of his stay, some of these motifs changed, but it seems that the two hour shift he, um, uh, per motif was a fixture throughout the trip. His wife, Alice, described this regimen in her correspondence to her daughter, Germaine Saleroux. On October 12, when the couple was still staying at the Palazzo Barbaro with their friend, Mary Young Hunter, who had invited them to Venice, Alice outlined the schedule as follows. So here it is. Our life here is perfectly regulated. First sentence. So I'm, I'm still stunned by this, right? Okay. Uh, if, uh, I have never written a postcard from the Jersey Shore, right, to anybody <laughs> that starts like my life is, is regulated, okay? Like, uh, um, okay, but, but there she is. From 8 a.m. on, we are at the first motif, San Giorgio, facing the Piazza San Marco. At 10 a.m., Piazza San Marco, facing San Giorgio. After lunch, Moni works on the steps of the Palazzo Barbaro, then at three o'clock on gondolas. We make a tour to admire the setting of the sun and return at 7 p.m., end quote. A few days later, on October 17, now installed at the Hotel Britannia, where they would spend the rest of their stay, the schedule had shifted somewhat, as Alice noted in another letter. Here we go again, quote, at 8 a.m. every day, we find ourselves installed at the first motif until 10 o'clock. We therefore have to get up at 6 a.m., then another motif from 10 a.m. to noon, from 2 to 4 p.m. in the canal, and from 4 to 6 p.m. from our window. You see how our hours are filled, and honestly, I don't know how he does it at his age without tiring, end quote. Tender, tender, tender. Um, 
In the few intervening days between Palazzo and hotel, the agenda seems only to have hardened and the two hour interval became more binding and mandatory. Actual sunrise is irrelevant to this temporal scheme and has been replaced with a uniform 6 a.m. start to the day, no matter if that time corresponded to the actual diurnal rhythm or first light. A particular weather effect did not particularly matter to this schedule either. Note that Elise doesn't even mention what motifs they are painting or what the weather was like or anything. She just names the times as long as it occurred within Monet's specific time intervals. When things needed to be packed up when the couple moved on to the next site at 10 a.m. or 4 p.m., say, the specific effect was interrupted too, no matter whether it had concluded. By Elisa's accounting, natural times were no real match for cultural ones, and certainly no match for the industrial age scheduling used here that dictated its exacting procedures at the expense of an untrammeled flow of nature and weather. Pizarro, Joaquin Pizarro, says rightly that Monet had, I quote, a fixed appointment with his motifs at the same time each day, end quote. At 8 a.m., when Monet started painting, he and Alice found themselves on the platform of the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, visible in the foreground of the paintings, looking over at the Doge's palace with the Campanile tower, the leftmost element in each iteration. At some point during the later mornings, likely as part of his trip back in the direction of San Marco, Moni painted his three close-up views of the Doge's palace from the perspective of a gondola, the unstable position that vexed him most given how difficult it was to identify precisely the same viewing point on water day after day. You can only imagine how he drove the gondolier crazy. And as I like said, no, I want to be over here in, uh, in, in, the, in the canal. At least when that spot was hard to find and the water underneath his feet wobbly, he knew what time it was. Here are two of them side by side. So you get a sense of the difference and repetition between them. From noon until two, the Monets took their lunch and therefore no Venetian scene shows any true midday effect. The precise afternoon schedule is a little more difficult to reconstruct since it includes a greater variety of motifs. In the earlier afternoons, it appears as if Monet spent some hours making views from the Palazzo Barbaro and other positions along the Grand Canal. From here and other vantage points along the canal, he painted the six views of Santa Maria della Salute seen across the canal and created his various views of Venetian palaces, such as the Palazzo Contarini Polignac, the Palazzo Dario, and the Palazzo da Mula. After mid-October, he also painted from and close to the Hotel Britannia, probably during the last two hour shift of his day. Moni was now looking out from his accommodation or walked the short distance towards the Piazzetta San Marco or the platform of the Schiavoni in front of the Doge's palace, looking back to where the day had started to the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. He made six very similar versions of this view. In the initial schedule, it appears, these canvases were started in the late morning from 10 to 11, uh, from 10 to 12 noon, but this appears to have shifted in the later schedule as the final painting seems to register an afternoon light effect as Daniel Wildenstein has suggested. Given some adaptation, however, this afternoon schedule fits roughly with Alice's second description, from two to four in the canal and from six, four to six from our window. Finally, at the end of some days, Moni walked further east, roughly to the entrance of the Via Garibaldi, in order to paint his two sun sunset views of San Giorgio Maggiore. Given that sunset fell outside his usual working hours that ended at six, Moni must have decided to labor occasionally in overtime, or perhaps these paintings were started early during the stay when observing the sunset was still an explicit part of his daily schedule. Remember that Alice mentions it in the first one, but not in the second. 
Of course, we cannot be certain how strictly Monet followed this overall regimen, and surely it was adapted to the immediate needs of each day, but its existence as a rhetorical and practical tool remains crucial. The resulting paintings taken together evince a curious admixture of temporalities. In general, because of Monet's strict schedule, time seems duplicated from one day to the next and thus frozen and stilled. Each group has its particular light condition that, no matter the particularity or the haziness of the scene, stands repeated in each. Most often, light streams into the scenes from the right. In each version of Santa Maria della Salute, for instance, the buildings to the church's right are hit by steady afternoon light from the right, especially the side wall of the Palazzo Daria. I think you can see that on the right side of the picture. The light in every version of the Doge's palace facade, no matter if seen from afar or in close up, bathes the palace roughly in the same angle of morning light. As Pizarro has emphasized, the lighting in each version of the same motif is remarkably stable and repetitive, more like a light switch Moni turned on when he arrived at the pre-selected hour. But this does not mean that time entirely disappears from view. It implies, rather, that time is present as an appointment with a monument, which is not a time outside of time, but a modern touristic version of time, naturalized as timeless. Such appointments with monuments, otherwise known to all of us as opening hours, um, were the daily bread of any tourist in Venice and elsewhere. Indeed, the guidebook to Italy that Monet bought in advance of his trip by Paul Joan, known as the famed Guide Joan for Italy, opening hours are often the first thing one reads about. What is more, this newest of guidebooks included a novel section called En Plat du Temps, or The Best Use of One's Time, which gave visitors tips about how to make the most of one's precious few days in Venice, creating an early form of a practical but also profoundly curated daily itinerary. For a brief trip to Venice, Joan recommended the following for the first day, sightseeing, I quote, first day, morning, Piazza San Marco, Piazzetta, Basilica San Marco, afternoon, Doge's Palace, and excursion by gondola on the Grand Canal, end quote. Juan thought that one could see about three to four major sites per day, which means given some time for lunch that he budgeted about two hours per visit, or about the same time Moni spent painting one view. Moni's two-hour appointments per motif expressly mirrored then a tourist time frame and temporal economy. For Venice, this mix was not unusual, but central to a traveler's temporal logic. It pervades the most famous texts about Venice as well. The sections about the city in Henry James's Italian Hours, for instance, published in 1909, the year after the Monet's visits, visit are exemplary. James extols the timelessness of Venice, including the loss of time one can experience there, ex especially there, speaking of, I quote, exquisite hours enveloped in light and silence, end quote. But he recommends to do so at specific hours of low tourist activity when time can finally stand still. Indeed, he recommends time best stops around 1 p.m. when others are lunching. Such advice does not strike us as unusual, but as germane to modern travel. Moni's own schedule is not fundamentally different. It is precisely the chronometric point from which to experience Venice's peculiar temporal beauty. As a matter of course, alongside the generalized sense of timelessness in Venice, modern time was everywhere if one knew where to look. The Monet's whole trip was based on it after all, based, that is, on the transportation schedules that brought them to Venice in the first place. Alisa's other letters are filled with the chronological exactitude that train schedules had made obligatory. A set of quotes now from her. Tomorrow we leave at 7.45. We just pass through the Simplon, 20 minutes of tunnel, and we are thinking about leaving Toulon at 5.30 in the evening that day of our arrival. That's the train that takes us to Paris, arriving at 7.30." End quote. 
once in Venice, posing for what is arguably the most famous photograph taken of the painter during his entire career, showing him and Alice um, on Piazza San Marco in front of the Basilica engulfed by Venice's infamous pigeons. Time was difficult to avoid. During the photo shoot on the couple's right stood one of the most famous public clocks ever built, one surely also on their agenda of must-see sites. The clock tower and clock, both built in the last decade of the 15th century, are marvels of timekeeping. In uh, 1908, it had only been a few years since the clock's original 24-hour clock face had been reconstructed and the 12-hour face, so the face more similar to our form of timekeeping, that was installed in the mid-18th century had been removed again. Do you see that they're actually literally standing underneath the clock in, the, in this slightly lesser known, I think, photograph, but made during that same uh, photo shoot? The original clock operated according to so-called Italian hours. Notice the reference that James's text cited earlier makes in its title to this form of timekeeping, which is a 24-hour time system lasting from sunset to sunset with hour one placed at right on the dial roughly where hour 3.30 is today. You can see that in the image on the upper right. By the early 20th century, there was much scholarly and tourist interest in this historical artifact of time and monographs on the San Marco bell tower, which had collapsed in 1902 and was rebuilt by 1912, and clock tower were published. By taking a brief look at the clock on the Piazza San Marco, the artificial structure of any time system must have become immediately apparent to the Monets. This is not an easy to read clock, right? That's, that is the basic um, uh, thing I'm trying to say. Around 1900, time talk in Venice was not exclusive to the clock tower. Italy was one of the first countries in Europe, along with Germany, to adopt Greenwich Mean Time in 1893, the time frame that had been voted internationally to become the universal one in 1884. When Italy adopted the new modern standard of international time in line with Greenwich in the early 1890s, advancing its previous national time by 10 minutes and four seconds, the country did so well before France did in the second half of the 20th century. France, and therefore the Monets themselves, relied since the 19-teens on what was then known as Paris Mean Time, which was Greenwich Mean Time minus 9 minutes and 21 seconds, the exact spatio-temporal difference between both locations. My point here with these details is the following. When the Monets arrived in Venice then, they did not only uh, arrive in a different time zone as we would today, they needed to adjust to a rather different system of timekeeping altogether. So French time is not yet on Greenwich Mean Time, but Italy already was. So you are basically switching whole time systems as you cross borders. By the late 19th century, time zones themselves had been under frequent consideration and a time zone called Adriatic time was under discussion to include Italy and Venice. The Monets were likely familiar also with the first discussions in Europe around daylight savings time then underway, namely the proposal to bring modern timekeeping into closer alignment with the annual fluctuations of daylight, a discussion that had started in the 1890s and was at its pinnacle in the years leading up to World War I when the practice was first more broadly adopted. This discursive and practical presence of time in Venice meant that it was generally understood that hours were more than an artificial divider of time. They were important social and political entities as well. When Monet divided his day into stable two-hour intervals in, to paint, he acknowledged as much himself. In the late 19th century, the historian Gustav Bilfinger, for instance, had spent an entire career historicizing the category of the hour, speaking of the modern hour, by which he meant a uniform hour of 60 minutes, which was different from the variable hour of pre-modern cultures, and the bourgeois day, namely the regularized organization of the modern day into 24 equal hours throughout the day, independent 
of agrarian and religious cycles, often marked by temporal expansion and contraction depending on the seasons. This was the time frame that Italian hours had prefigured centuries earlier, paving the way for the secularization and industrialization of time that the Monets were now living. I do not expect Monet to have read Bilfinger himself, but I want to point to the existence of this literature nonetheless in order to highlight the fact that an hour was anything but a neutral temporal category in Monet's day, but a deeply contested entity of time, one known to have changed over the course of history and to have only recently taken its contemporary shape. When Monet painted Venice in regular two-hour intervals, he registered not just Venice's peculiar timelessness, but the flattening and regularization of the modern hour as well. What he demonstrated in Venice was both the regularity of his schedule and of an hour as a unit of time framing that schedule. Features whose uniformity echoed, but only echoed, a city in which time had effectively stopped. To paint with regularity was precisely the means toward an image of timelessness, because uniform time now looked like all the time there was, or the only time there is, as it is for us today. I think there's really only one, um, uh, one form of timekeeping. The paintings of Venice bear out such a reading. As has often been remarked, including by Joachim Pizarro, I quote, this is unquestionably one of Monet's unquestionably, I'm always careful using that word, but uh, here, he, here he does use it. Uh, Monet's most systematic series. The six canvases of the Grand Canal are almost exactly the same dimension, 73 by 92 centimeters. The layout of the motif is virtually identical in all, and each of the canvases was painted at the same time of day, end quote. Let me add that the striking visual fact that all Venice pictures in their overall composition focus on the watery surface in the bottom half and on the buildings in the upper half as if the world was nearly perfectly divided between the real and its reflection, a distinction Monet then tended to diminish by making the structures appear ethereal and enveloped in haze as if mere apparitions. Overall, the Venetian group is a study in regularity in terms of setup, format, composition, paint handling, and also time frame. It is an utterly controlled environment, as Pizarro has rightly put it. But this formal uniformity, which looks so timeless, is in fact lodged deeply inside the works, registering the regular schedule by which they were created, such as the modern temporal condition itself, after all, its regularity becomes visible only through the emotional charge of timelessness and spatial, watery, unmooring. Monet's topsy-turvy world of water, painted on water, is highly regularized after all and highly regularized by time. And I think the two are connected. In Venice, the appearance of small gondolas on the water is another instant when Monet acknowledged elements of movement while painting. They appear here or there in the backgrounds of the scenery, not unlike the studio boats of earlier paintings, but now even more removed and smaller. Almost as if compensating for their tiny appearance, Geoffroy pointedly compared these indications of transport, especially in the views of San, Mar San Giorgio Maggiore, to black swallows dashing through the scenes. In the general air of timelessness of the Venice views, Geoffroy clearly wished for some features of the paintings to hurry up and to concretize. My point here then is this. When in the 1870s, Monet still actively painted studio boats and the like to demonstrate his practice, such literal evocations of the painter's unstable place had disappeared when he painted in Venice some 30 years later. In the place of that absence, time itself, a modern regular schedule, had forced its way deeply into Monet's frame of mind, doing similar labor, namely the imaginative stabilizing of unstable, watery points of view. The very last painting Monet made on the last day of his stay in Venice was, we will now not be surprised to see, the rare and only painting of a gondola. 
Unfinished, it is the only work of the group that centers Monet's mode of transportation, the point from which he painted or reached his points of painting. But it also proves how thoroughly Monet had pushed these boats out of sight for the previous two months. When Monet was back in Giverny, to conclude, by mid-December, the very first letter he sent, as far as come down to us, was a brief missive to Geoffroy, dating to the 20th of the month. I ask you, this is the quote, I ask you to please send me word immediately to the Hotel Terminus, which is where he was staying in Paris, telling me which day, Tuesday or Wednesday, I can stop by around nine in the morning to pick you up to have lunch um, with my wife and myself in haste and friendship, Claude Monet, end quote. When Mooney wrote in haste and wanted clarity on the appointment ahead, as we all do on occasion, Venice seems already to have far retreated into um, distant memory. What is less clear is whether Mooney had brought this temporal pressure to Venice and sublimated it there into his painting schedule, or whether he had brought it back from Venice to Giverny, now a fundamental aspect of his late Impressionism. Most likely, I think it was both. What is also certain is that Monet's watery surfaces, for all the unmooring, seasickness, and constant change they portray, were always perfectly timed. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, gave us so much to think about. Um, we have time for a few questions, so please raise your hands. We will pass you the mic. Please speak into the mic so that the people online can hear you. Um, and then if people online have questions, type them into the chat and we will read them out loud. Hi, thank you so much for your talk, found it really interesting. Um, I wanted to know, we're talking about kind of flattening out time, right? And with that light in lots of ways in these paintings. And I wanted to know, um, how is that kind of contrasted to the work that he did with the cathedrals in Rouen, where light plays such an important role? And he's looking at how it changes from time to time. But I don't know if he had that same kind of exactitude in schedule, and maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems like that was such a pivotal point for that type of painting. Yeah, nice question. And um, uh, I, I completely agree that something shifts here. And part of my point is to to diagnose that shift, right? That um, in by, by the 1890s and the other series that he does before he arrives in London, let's say, and then Venice in 1908, the, the kind of instant and the variability of the instant still plays a much greater role. So at the, in the Rouen Cathedral, even though he looks at that facade over and over again, they are much more varied in the light effects that he is choosing. So um, the question that I'm asking here is, why is it that when he's in Venice, he, he, is, he is now at a point where what has animated his, almost his entire practice, that variability of the instant, now becomes such a stable or more stable category, right? That he even wants this schedule to fix it. It's there, uh, and, and that is a particular fixation. So, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping that part of this has to do with the, uh, with the wish, right? The unspoken wish to, to, to stabilize this uncertain position from which he was painting here, right? And, and in, in Rouen, he is at a much more stable, no, but no less interesting place, right? He's, in a, um, uh, uh, he's on the second floor of a building opposite of the cathedral that was occupied um, by, by a, a clothing maker, I believe now. I don't know, yeah, sorry, but, um, uh, so uh, that also is a very interesting place from which to look, right? And he looks through a window at that facade. But obviously, he has uh, a nice wooden floor under his feet or so. You know, he's not in a gondola. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to argue that there are connections here between the wobbliness of the, <laughs> of the spot and, and then 
the imaginative sort of stricture of time that he places on that experience. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. I'm not sure if this is a uh, uh, an apt connection, but um, are there any uh, connections to like present day time lapse photography, where sort of you stay in a, a similar spot and watch scenes evolve over time, or is that a is that a too big of a jump? Um, yes and no. Um, Yes, it is because the kind of time lapse mechanism is, is is would not have been part very much of Monet's. What would have been is uh, what is known as chronometric photography, right? the uh, photography that uh, is able, starting in the 1870s, to uh, register on one plate. Uh, Marais is the French photographer. Edward Muybridge is the American one. To um, to start to register movement photographically, right? and this will eventually lead to the invention of film in the 1890s. And and Monet lives this. Monet is actually one of the first film painters who is documented in filmically. It's a really beautiful sort of two-minute clip online where you can uh, where you can see him. So. Um, he has, by this point, this happens in 1915, that he's filmed by uh, uh, an actor filmmaker named Sacha Guitry. Uh, and by this point, he has totally adapted his way of depicting to the filmic medium uh, in terms of the time of the filmic medium and the recording, uh, and, and he's very much acting, um, acting there. So the, uh, while that particular technology would not have been part of his frame of mind. Um, the, the broader question you're asking about the time and other uh, media, uh, especially photography and film, would have been completely part of his painterly logic by this point. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to ask my own question. Um, that was so, uh, so interesting and um, so fascinating. I, I want to hear more about and and it took me a while, but you 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 convinced me that these um, that the Venice paintings are do seem to be sort of frozen in time, or that they're not about the passage of time. Um, but can you say more about how that happens pictorially? Like if we didn't know anything about the 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 the, the schedule or any of that. Just looking at the picture, can you, and, and maybe, I don't know which ones you want to talk about, but I liked the, I thought the last comparison was useful. Um, how, do you, how do you represent the non-passage of time versus the passage of yes. time? Yes, yes. Great, Martha, thank you. Um, Moni is so careful about this, right? And it's such an interesting question. If we look at these five pictures, I don't think before this time, London may be the may be the exception, but I, and I haven't really looked at at the groupings all that carefully. But if you look at any of the previous motifs that he repeats, he is not ever going to make a group of pictures. These are five of the six he he makes, uh, where the light falls into the scene at exactly the same angle at exactly the same time of day. Do you see how the Palazzo Dario here is illuminated? How in each of these versions, the the you know the painting's right side of the cupola here is illuminated by uh, by natural light. Well, um, when I see that, I do understand what Joachim Pizarro means by he had an, a, a specific daily appointment with this motif. And that's where I think it registers, right? And, and it doesn't just re register as an accident. To me, it registers as something, as something he actually very powerfully paints, right? It is, this is something that you see when you see the paintings together. And remember that at Bernheim Jeune, there are 29 of them. So you do see several simultaneously, which is such a rare experience today because they have all been scattered. But once you see them as a group, then um, even though some of them are a little bit bluer and a little cooler, and some of them are a little warmer and greener. 
Um, once you look away from that and look at the way the light falls, then you see the stability of light, right? And once you see that stability, you also, I think, see a certain loss of time. And, and this is not the only group. This, in each of the groups he makes in Venice, you can observe the same phenomenon, that each of the groupings has exactly the same time in the picture. And I, I really can't think of a previous group where that happened, right? Again, the Rouen Cathedral ones or so, it, it's just, um, it's not unsystematic and it's not um, completely uh, uh, willy-nilly that, that light flies or, and flows over this facade, but, but it is not um, uh, by hour. We, we know and we think that the Rouen Cathedral show in 1895 was probably organized by the different color schemes of the series. So there was a, a bluish section and a more pinkish section. Um, so that was the organizing principle. Uh, I don't think we know how the, how the Bernheim Jeune sh uh, show was hung. We have the catalog and there the, these are all listed, like the motifs are listed in groups together. Martha, does that help a little bit? Can you, can you, can you see it a bit better now? Yes. For sure, thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, ask an online question. Um, I think this one. Okay. So, uh, even with his strict schedule, how does Monet account for the gondola in a, in a, inevitably moving? This movement affects the timelessness of the picture unless he is painting certain areas of the canvas from memory. Yes. Nice. I like that question a lot. Um, um, so first, like most of these pictures are not painted from gondolas, right? So I, I, I was a bit uh, cheeky in, uh, in, in, in making you believe that they were, right? They are, most of them are painted from platforms and, and very close to the water's edge, right? But, and it's only the, I don't want to um, uh, flip 20 times now, but you will remember the, 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 the Doors Palace pictures. Those are the only ones that he literally painted from a gondola, and there are only three of, uh, of those. But they are, to me, the kind of paradigmatic. Venetian painting, right? because they are precisely um, that um, uh, that that mobility comes into play, right? And the um, and and we do have a letter. Uh, it's I forget whether it's by Elise or by him, where he, where he was just frustrated by the fact that the gondolas couldn't couldn't arrive back at that same spot that he <laughs> wanted, right? A, a day after day after day, you know, it's just. Um, uh, it would be like trying to find a, a, a penny on 76 every uh, on, 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 uh, uh, every day, you know. So, um, uh, so, uh, but but I'm saying that in order to say that even though not all of it happened on the gondola, just imagine so much of their travel. You know, they, they took gondola trips and so on. The, here's a whole city where where the transport is all uh, water based, right? And that. Um, and, and, and I think that some of, of that instability that Mooney should have been so used to, right? He spent so much of his time on, uh, on water. Um, he should have been used to it that, it, that, that I'm, I'm thinking, I'm arguing, I, I, I want to understand whether, whether the rigidity of that schedule, right, was, was some kind of response to, to that instability heightened by being so much on, on gondolas. Sorry, hello, Professor. We've 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 spoken in class about um, the series being an expert, like being driven by the development of the the impressionist market or the market for art in in France in that period. And of course, this is you know perhaps an extreme example in that he's chosen to paint the exact same scene at the exact same time five times. But um, to what extent is this driven by his? economic concerns or economic considerations and, and, and the, those are the wider market versus you know him actually choosing to paint the same scene five times I mean is it I mean he, he, he does these series and starts doing these series because of the development of the market almost like or that's the sense I got he's encouraged by his dealer and then what yeah to what extent is, is that the dealer and him yeah yeah thank you 
Look at that, everybody witnessed my, my, my teaching in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in action. You know, wow, thank you, thank you. I, I was so pleased. Um, uh, good question. Um, <laughs> so basically, you're asking me whether, whether making an even more similar painting than he had been making for the previous 15 or so, almost 20 years, uh, would serve a certain market purpose, meaning that uh, he wanted to make five people happy roughly with the same picture or something like that. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I think that could well be part of it. At, at this time, um, when he goes to Venice and when um, he comes back, he takes a little, um, uh, Alice dies shortly after, the, not shortly, but a year or two after the trip, um, and he stops painting for a while. So um, it, it's a, it's the, the years after Venice are fairly difficult. Um, and when he reemerges and arranges for this show with, with, um, with Bernheim Jeune Gallery, right? um, for those of you who have seen one or two shows previously dedicated to Monet's series exhibitions, will know that the 1890s one were at Durand Ruel Gallery. So, um, and and some of the other letters we have from 19, I think this starts in 1910, 1911, uh, he totally plays Durand Well and Bernheim Jeune out against one another. And they both actually come and, uh, and are like salivating for these pictures and each wants, wants to represent them and show them. Um, so Moni is a terribly savvy marketer by, uh, by this time. Um, uh, so, so yes, he is completely, he is supplying a market. I'm not sure whether it makes a difference to that market if the five versions here of the canal view are so similar, if they were a little bit more different, right? That question I cannot answer and find difficult to answer, right? Whether the, whether the similarity is intended for the market, right? That I'm, that I'm having a harder time saying a kind of direct and quick yes to, you know, but um, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. It's a good question. There are um, s several questions in the chat about uh, clouds and weather, so I'll let Maria read them. Yeah. Uh, um, so they um, ask, does he pur uh, purposely ignore the cloud patterns in all the pictures to stop time? And how does the variation in weather affect how he paints? And how do we tell this? Mm -hmm. Nice, nice question. I like the weather question. Um, um, obviously, first thing to say, I think it was pretty nice fall in Venice so when they were there. <laughs> no, so, so I, I'm, I, I don't expect him to have um, uh, ignored the clouds or so. You know, I, that 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 is not what what Moni would have done. Um, the it's, to me, it's interesting how a kind of earlier impressionism in the 1870s, even the 1880s, is much more cloud and cloud-shaped focused than the kind of hazier pictures of the, after 1900 or so. You know, like in, in London or even here, um, he, he gets much more invested in that idea of the envelope and the envelope, right? Some kind of haze that, um, that, that, and, um, that is everywhere. That's not exactly a weather or so, you know, and, and certainly not, um, not a set of clouds. So that takes a bit priority. So I'm, I'm beginning to ask myself whether that also meant that there could have been clouds here. He just didn't. Um, uh, uh, he just preferred the sort of slight haze over the specificity of them. But I'm, I'm predicting that many days in Venice were, were, were really quite nice. And, and the letters that, um, the Alice read letters that I have read, um, there are some complaints about the weather. Um, and later on, um, you know, they stay, imagine this, they arrive in October. I'm sure it was pretty, sure it was pretty nice. But by the time they leave in December, um, uh, that decision is very weather-based, and Moni often writes about, you know, um, uh, he, he would stay or prolong a trip if the weather was good and, and would leave if the weather was bad. So I know that the uh, early days in December were not the nicest, so that's actually the impetus of them leaving. So there are weather questions at stake here. 
um, uh, and I and I'm not sure, uh, however, how to answer the cloud aspect of this. You know, let me let me look at some of the other pictures and see how prominent clouds are. Um, by this time in his oeuvre, I would sort of venture to guess they are, they are no longer the sort of central indicators of the instant that they once were. I think they had sort of subsided a bit as, as for him doing that. And uh, I think we have time for one more. Thank you. Um, I had a question about um, the extent to which Monet may have been aware of Venice's decay, um, which he may have kind of, if you could say more about um, what he knew about that discourse, whether through Ruskin or whether through visiting, viewing like hordes of tourists and Venice like literally sinking under their weight. Um, if you could say something more about that. Yes, yes, I can try. Um, Monet definitely read Ruskin, we know that. It's also in, uh, mentioned in, uh, in the letters, and I think there's a text in, in his library. So Ruskin, totally part of um, uh, his frame of mind. The, the Italian Hours by James is very much about this phenomenon. Um, we, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, it, the difference to today's attitude to this question, however, is quite different, right? I, I, I wouldn't think that by starting to think about and fetishize this decay, there's necessarily um, uh, anything eco-critical and so on uh, at work here, right? There's not, Monet is not painting Venice or going to Venice and, and literally seeing um, a city sinking because of rising ocean levels and so on, right? That is not the, that is not the level of discourse, right? So the decay is a much more, um, it is there, it is felt, uh, it is described, um, and uh, it is much more, it's still much more romanticized. You know, obviously someone like Ruskin does have a pretty good eco-critical bent, you know, if you want to call it that. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that it would be easy to translate that into these pictures, you know, so, um, uh, and especially when we look at the Palazzo paintings or so, you know, which are just so incredibly gorgeous. Um, uh, where are they? Uh, they? They totally do have like a, a, a sinking, like they, they are just ever so slightly off balance, right? And so that too, so if you want to read it in that way, I totally, I, I wouldn't stop anybody, but I'm, uh, but it's it's hard to really pin that down with any concreteness. Okay. Okay. I think. Um, <laughs> I think we we can let Andre off the hook now. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for that brilliant talk. Um, and we will see you next time. Have a good evening.